Go. So welcome everyone to the Business Builder. Thank you for joining us today. I am very much looking forward to today's session because Robin McMoyney is one of my favorite people and she has been working with businesses for over 20 years, helping them maximize their growth opportunities and avoid commercial pitfalls, which is what she is talking about today. Robin has extensive experience across multiple industries and across country borders. Uh, and she has coached and mentored many young graduates and business owners in career development and business growth. And I cannot think of a better person to teach us how to avoid business closure than a lawyer and a business owner. So Robin, you are very welcome. And I'm so very pleased to have you here today. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, share my screen and then we can get started. There we go. My screen is loading. Okay, so I just want to whip around the room quickly um, for you to introduce yourself. Um, tell me what you're hoping to learn. And then what do you think causes businesses to fail? And just by way of introduction for myself, I am a former insolvency lawyer. I still do some insolvency related work. And over the last 20 years, I've dealt with more than 200 restructuring. Um, so whether that is the liquidation of businesses, business rescue, turnaround, um, uh, we've done many, many, many over the years. And what I eventually couldn't do anymore, I just couldn't watch this car crash, um, watching businesses hit the wall and hit the wall and hit the wall. So I started going more and more into advisory work and into um, in, um, commercial work where I could actually help businesses prevent these things before they got out of hand. So it's interesting for me when I talk to groups of people to see what they think the causes of failure in businesses are. So I'm going to just... I don't have a great view here. Um, so, Carla, why do you think businesses fail? And what do you want to learn today? Um, I would say that what I think it could be, or one of the things could be cash flow. I think that's yeah. a big thing. And um, what I want to learn today is just how not to crash and burn and how not to lose my business and not be in that position where... I need to call you and ask you to help me. So I want to prevent that. <laughs> cool. And you, Leila? What I want to learn today is, like Carla said, to not fall in the trap of having to say, Robin, I need help. <laughs> but I think one of the, the causes of business failing is denial. You can see see it's going down, but you like, it's going to come right. It's going to come right. And then when it's too late for you to actually turn around and be like, okay, now I can't fix it. So I think that's, that's for me, a main thing. Yeah, definitely. And Lana? Um, I think from my side, I guess it's, it's a combination of how not to get there, but then also how to recognize when you do need the help. <laughs> when yeah. do you call um and also when do you admit defeat because at some point you know what are you looking at so that's that's what I would like to know sure Benita uh, hello everybody um yeah I think definitely you know some of the causes is poor management and whether that's you know poor self-management in the business as the head of the business or your management team um, you know, that can really sink a ship. But um, so, yes, yeah, in terms of what we hope to get out of today, I think is just that, not waiting to, you know, I think what Carla said, like, I don't want to get to the point where, I mean, I love you, Robin, but where I have to phone you and go, help me, I've crashed and burned. Um, yeah. But to actually prevent that and the steps that we, you know, sort of the warning signs, see those amber lights instead of the red robot. So, yes, um, you know, forearmed, forewarned is forearmed. So there we go. Correct. And Jamie, back from Greece and all relaxed. Do you even do you even think businesses fail after 
this long holiday of yours? <laughs> well, I'm um, kickstarting off the back in the office um, type of jargon. So this, this um, workshop today is something that I hope will be the beginning of the last term of this year. Um, I do think businesses can fail because I have seen that. Um, and I think what comes to mind for me is, and especially in my own business, is when we start to diversify our services um, and then sort of get all muddled up with what are the actual goals now of my business. Um, so I think that can cause cause some problems. And yeah, just like the rest of the group, I really want to know more so that I can hopefully identify um, when those those struggles or those obstacles um, end up, um, I end up facing them. Cool. Alison, from a, you've got a more of a corporate background. What are your views? Yeah, so also um, had a lot to do with uh, mostly family owned, a sort of small to medium sized retail businesses run by entrepreneurs. So um, I think from experience has been a f the owner, the manager, this attitude to the business um, and then secondly just poor financial and trade disciplines that um, yeah they just let go so I think those for me were probably the most common areas um, and then yeah just to get out of it um, this afternoon is just to, to hear your perspectives and just you know pragmatic sort of um, advice on on this given the fact that I will still be working with family businesses moving forward. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Sean, what do you think is the reason for businesses to fail? Um, I'm not overly familiar with the, the topic, so I'm here to, to learn and observe today. Thank you. Sure. And Tamron, as the, as the accountant on the call, absolutely. what do you think is Financial the Financial literacy and fail? cash flow, absolutely. <laughs> you need a good accountant. Okay, cool. <laughs> You always need a good accountant. So I want to ask you one other question that you can think about. I'm not going to ask you in person, but what do you what do you think businesses can do to prevent failure? Just give it a moment. We work in an uh, extremely difficult economy in South Africa. We've got a lot of external factors. We've got a lot of... Um, factors that make it difficult for us to make a rand. But at the same time, although we are becoming more and more of a highly regulated economy, we still it's still easier to make a rand than a pound because we've got wiggle room in our economy and we are, as a rule, resilient business owners. So if you had to ask me, and some of you got this bang on, what causes businesses to fail? It's poor management in every single case. And I can say that without arrogance, I've lost a business too. And I can tell you there, it was also down to poor management. Now, before you all jump up and down and say, yes, but COVID, yes, but COVID, COVID is an anomaly. It's a, well, it may not be an anomaly going forward. They're predicting a pandemic every 25 years, which means that now as business owners, we have to factor the possibility of a pandemic into our planning. But as a rule, management is everything, whether it is financial management, people management, marketing management, whatever it is, management of a business throughout the business cycle is absolutely key. So my experience has been more and almost without fail, the fact that management has been short sighted or they haven't had good goal setting or they haven't even got mindset. You know, it's it ranges from the hard skills to the soft skills. But uh, Tamron is absolutely right in the sense that financial management is key, but it's not the only thing. One of the key things that I see in businesses is by the time a business gets to me, whether it is in end, step, end of life, where we're basically pumping it full of morphine and letting it die slowly, or whether we just a turnaround phase, it depends on where management is. Is management burnt out? Is the owner ready to save the business? What is the owner looking to do? Have they had enough? So essentially what I'm going to chat to you about is we're gonna do five case studies today. 
And these are all the clients that I've dealt with. So businesses that I've dealt with, and I'm going to give you scenarios where this kind of management issue resulted in the death of a business. And then I'm going to compare it to clients that I have who have well and truly um, overcome the same kind of issues. So let's start with the first thing to say is that business doesn't have to be draining. It doesn't have to mean that there's no money. You know, as small business owners, I often find, well, I often find that small business owners think small. They think they're small businesses. They behave like small businesses. They play with other small businesses. They don't run with the big dogs. And as a result, they only ever see a culture of scarcity. And making decisions out of fear is never a positive thing. It's not great to decide on how to run your business when all you want to do is survive. Survival mode is not running a business. Survival mode is having an expensive hobby. You need to get to the point where you're actually enjoying what you do, where you're on a quest as opposed to a wolf, a battlefield. So let's look at the first example. Oh, now, I can't, now he's very excited. There we go. So the first one is a technician versus a business owner. Now, those of you that have had any kind of business learning, have read any kind of business books, will know this term. So um, a technician is someone who is very good at what they do. And a business owner is someone who runs an enterprise, no matter how big or small, that eventually will run without them. So most people start a business because they have a skill. So I want to tell you the story about a guy. Well, all, all names have been changed to protect confidentiality, obviously. Um, I want to tell you about a guy called Victor. Now, I met Victor in December 2017. And Victor's an amazing guy. He's an incredibly good um, engineer. He specialized in making those substations, those metal substations that now only work intermittently because of ESCOM, but he would buy material, make the substations, and then send them back. And he was booming. He was turning over tens and tens and tens of millions of rands. He bootstrapped his business. He came up from nothing. But he was incredibly arrogant. He told me in our first meeting in, in that December, he said to me, I don't believe in lawyers. So I said to him, Victor, we are not like Santa. You don't get to choose whether or not to believe in us. We do actually exist. That That is how it works. And he said, no, my wife does the books. My aunt does the contracts. The whole family is involved in the business. I'm turning, at the, the year before he had turned over, over 55 million. His business had been going for about five years and he was very proud, rightfully so, of what he had built, but there was no cash. And he had signed an agreement with a huge for a huge contract that he hadn't costed properly. And it was a simple matter of not costing in tax. He hadn't taken into account the impact of that. Something very simple. But when he'd done his costing, he'd got it all wrong. So he was making a loss on his biggest contract. So I said to him, well, look, we're going to need to have a serious look at this. We have to either renegotiate with your supplier or, you know, this business is going to fold. So he says to me, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. He stormed out of the boardroom. And I thought, well, Victor, it was nice to meet you, but... Clearly, that's that. February 2018, Victor was back, this time worse than ever. This time, it turned out that the reason that we couldn't fold the business immediately was because Victor had taken money out of the business on loan account, and he owed the business 3 million rand. The business had continued to depreciate. There was huge debt. The equipment had started being stripped away and sold, and, and there was nothing I could do. So I warned him that the liquidator would come in, close the business, and demand the money that he had taken out of the business back. But he said, no, it was fine. He could afford to repay it, make a payment arrangement. So that's what happened. 
business closed, liquidator came in, monies were demanded. Before we closed the business, I said to him, Victor, have you signed any sureties? No, he said, I do. I never sign surety with any of my suppliers. After the liquidation of the business, it turned out he had signed 30 sureties because he hadn't read his supply agreements and he didn't want me to look at the agreements before the liquidation. Victor was also married in community of property. Victor and his wife were sequestrated. Their kids were taken out of school, out of private school. And essentially, they lost absolutely everything. Now, Victor really acted in a, from a place of arrogance, fear, and ignorance. He didn't want to see what was there. He didn't want to look, like Layla said, there was a sense of denial. He knew you don't storm out of a meeting because you think you got it right. You storm out because you are afraid. And he, was, he knew there was something wrong. He was deeply afraid, but he was also ignorant. He chose not to have somebody to surround him, somebody to actually help him to have an accountant as opposed to, you know, your wife doing the books when she's not, a, she's not even a bookkeeper. So I want to compare Valen, um, Victor to a client of mine called Valentine. Now, Valentine owns an engineering company. He is an engineer, just like um, Victor is. Oh, let me just quickly tell you the good news about Victor. In the end, Victor did lose everything. But he started again and he got um, business partners from Sweden. I had a look at his agreements. He got brand new business partners and is absolutely thriving because at heart, he's good at what he does. He's got a high risk profile and now he has lawyers and accountants and very and very parat business partners from Sweden. So don't worry about Victor. He's fine. Valentine, on the other hand, was and is a client of mine that is just soaring. Also an engineer, totally brilliant, intelligent, um, you know, driven, has great visions. But what he has is an appreciation for what he doesn't know. He's not a humble man, don't get me wrong. He doesn't behave with a touch of humility, but he is so driven that he knows that if he wants to get where he wants to go, he has to have what I refer to as a council of elders, people that can surround him to take his business further. He has an amazing accountant. He has an amazing lawyer, I think. And he has all the right people in place to help him make decisions. He's got his BE structures in place. He's got his legal agreements in place. I helped him, we did, a, we did an amazing deal to buy property out of a business rescue, which was very complicated, but he could see the value. He just didn't know how to unlock it. So he brought in the right person with the right experience and we unlocked that value. And what's exciting about Valentine is that he doesn't for one moment think that he is a lawyer or an accountant or an HR specialist he knows that he's a visionary. He's not an implementer. His business is also now about five years old. He is doing work all over the country, turning many, many millions, employing people, working in the most incredible projects, and all because he has evolved to be a business owner. He's not just an engineer anymore. So... What I want to do and encourage you is if you've started a business around a skill, and I know a lot of you on the call, and a lot of you have, just remember that being good at what you do, and Tamron will say this again and again and again, I've heard her say it, being good at what you do does not make you a business owner. It makes you a technician. If you want to be a business owner, you have to think differently. You have to get people around you that can help you actually build a business. Oh, why do I keep getting this, guys? Sorry. Please don't. Oh, there we go. The second thing that I find with business owners is there's a failure to adapt. I have to tell you the story. You're going to think that I'm lying, but this is a true story. I had a 
client come to me, 20 years in the catering industry. Big business had been supplying, had found a niche, and that niche was catering to the film industry. All right. So at the time, there were not a lot of caterers in that niche. And he had built, when he started out, he built this amazing business. 20-year business, suddenly, God, it was just something was wrong. There was no cash. And often when people come to see me, they say to me, there's no, there's something wrong with my business. There's no cash. Now, something wrong with my business, there's no cash can mean anything. It can mean anything from I don't have good books to somebody is stealing money from me to I've taken too much money out of the business. It can mean anything. So I said, okay, bring me your books and bring me your contracts and bring me any letters of demand, bring me everything. They arrived with, you know, those rotor trim boxes of paper, rotor trim box of summonses. They had been sued by just about everyone. Their books were two Excel spreadsheets and they had no, no management count, no profit and loss, no statement of affairs. They just worked on a cash basis. So they were working, what was in the bank is what they had to spend. They had made the decision to grow because the market in Cape Town was shrinking because now there's more and more people getting on the bandwagon for um, catering to the, the film industry. They were no longer ahead of the pack. So they decided to expand into Namibia. Unfortunately, they didn't have the money for the growth. So instead of growing profit, they grew turnover. So the revenue, the money coming in was more, but their profits were less because they were stretching their cash. They were robbing Peter to pay Paul. They didn't have a cost center. They didn't know what was coming in from Namibia as opposed to what was coming in from South Africa. They didn't keep on top of their business trends. They didn't know what the trends in the industry were. They weren't curious. And to be curious is, an, is such an important quality in a business owner. To know what's out there, to understand where your business is going. You know, people today, the equivalent would be, you know, shutting down any thought of AI because you think it's going to steal your job. Even if you never use AI, you need to know what it is. You need to know what the trends are in your business and you need to have systems for change. You can't just change. You need to have an underlying system. Unfortunately, the catering company did not survive and people behave erratically when businesses close and they had food trucks all over the country because they were filming all over the country. And one of the directors had a moment and got into one of the trucks and just drove into a Mozambique. He just ran away with the truck. So I got hold of him and I said, you and the truck need to return because currently you have stolen property from the liquidator. So he came back. He admitted he panicked and this was all he had. Now, I want to compare them to a client I know I work with who runs a promotional gifting company. So you look at promotional gifting and you think, well, how innovative can you and adaptive can you possibly be? This business has grown in the last five years to heights that I would never have expected, to turning profit that is beyond what I thought a promotional gifting business could turn. They are now one of the top five um, promotional gifting um, customers of, of the the gifting suppliers in the country. So I don't know if you know how promotional gifting works. You've got essentially the company is like a broker. They help you make a decision on what pens and notepads and jackets and umbrellas or whatever corporate gifting you want. Um, what works, what, what will work for you, then they buy the material, they get it all sorted out for you and they deliver it to you. So there's a bit of a brokerage to it. You can imagine what happened to this business when COVID hit. Nobody was doing golf days. Nobody was doing in-person meetings. Nobody wanted pens or notebooks or mug warmers or anything. Everyone was stuck behind the screen and they panicked. They didn't know what to do. But what they did have was a business enabler. 
they went to somebody who consulted to their business and said, well, one of the things you do is promotional workwear. So if you belong to Mercedes and you work for Mercedes, you've got a shirt that says Tamron Dix, Mercedes, Ben, South Africa. They said, go to businesses and punt workwear that is all uniform. So when people are sitting on a call, they all look the same. They're wearing the same shirt. They've got the same branding. You can see what they look like, who they're from. It's professional. They did this. They pivoted their business and it grew exponentially during COVID. Post-COVID, they've managed to land international clients because of the visibility of their brand. And it has been, and, and these, these are very normal people, very ordinary people. We're not talking about MBA level um, business owners. We're talking about people that just were curious. They asked for help. They looked at the business trends. They put their systems for change in place and they grew their business through COVID. They adapted. They didn't pivot. They didn't create masks. They didn't do any of those things. They adapted. And as a result, their business systems really worked and really covered, covered their butts and caused growth. So lesson three is choosing the wrong business partner. I, it's hard for me to choose only one example of this because I see it all the time. And Layla, who's worked with me for a good number of years, will have seen it as well. She's probably listening to these going, yep, I remember this guy. Um, if you go into business with someone, you're basically marrying them, okay? You need to have an ANC, you need to do some marriage prep, you need to have some vows in place, and you need to have a plan for death or divorce. When you start, I when cl clients come to me and they say, we are going to go into business together, um, whether it's a startup or whether they're two large businesses going into some kind of merger, it doesn't matter. The principles are the same. I will send them, um, especially for smaller businesses, I will send them what I call the marriage prep document. And what it is, it's a document that you go through that asks hard questions. And those questions include, why are you going into business? What do you want to do with the profits? Are you going to reinvest the profits? Or are you going to take them out? What are your views on dividends? What are your views on who does what? What are your views on, is this a long-term plan or is this a short get in, get out, sell the business? What happens if one of us dies? What happens if one of us wants to get out? And actually sit and have those hard conversations. And sometimes those conversations are so hard that they have to be mediated, that somebody has to hold a space to actually ventilate these issues. But then what happens is you take your vows, you sign your shareholders agreement, you sign your MRI, you put your documentation in place and you say, this is what I promise to do. And then if somebody wants out or dies, you've got um, buy and sell agreements, you've got all kinds of systems that you can put in place to make sure that as business partners, you grow and grow and grow together as opposed to apart. So I had two clients come to me who wanted to join their businesses and they had really, really exciting businesses. Very unusual concept um, within the wedding industry, ironically, and they wanted to work together. But even as we started to prepare the documents, I could see that this was a match made in hell. And I said to them, guys, I don't think you can work together. You've got very different views, very different values, and very different ideas for the future of this business. No, they told me, opposites attract. Well, opposites did not attract. And what happened was they all went away. They, two of them went away in the honeymoon phase of their um, their business relationship, and they didn't sign the shareholders agreement. They decided they didn't want to be regulated by a piece of paper. Needless to say, after a year, the business hit the rocks because the partners had got to the point where they couldn't even speak to each other without lawyers. 
they decided to separate. They decided mutually they were going to go their own ways, but they couldn't agree the value of the business. So the one partner wanted three million for his for to be bought out, and the other partner said that the business was worth ten million. So we were so far apart we couldn't agree. In fact, in my view, the business wasn't even worth three million because it was so deadlocked and clients had been poisoned and it was all kinds of things. So what happened in the end was the business had to be liquidated. There was no way that the business could operate. So we had to liquidate the business. We had to let all the staff go. We had to bring in a liquidator. We had to sell all the assets, split everything, lost massive value. And all because they didn't have an exit plan. They didn't have how, do, how are we going to value the business if one of us wants to get out? What are we going to do? How, who is in charge of what? What are our marketing targets? It just was an uncomfortable fit. And they were they're both creative, so their personalities had a lot to do with it. But the wrong business partner can sink even the best business. So I want to compare this to a business that's actually in Venita's line of work, um, a HR consultancy, a large South African HR consultancy. And they decided to go into business with another HR consultancy. The difference was tangible. We had meetings about where we were going to go, what kind of business was going to be run, who the clients were going to be, how are we going to deal with clients, what happens if somebody wants to exit? Because one of the partners um, moved to Canada and was working remotely. What happens if it doesn't work out for her? How are we going to deal with if people leave? What are we going to do about clients? Are we going to have restraints of trade in place? What kind of restraints are we going to have? It was absolutely a different kind of experience, a different set of conversations. And there were many conversations before the decision was made. And under those circumstances, we had a massively successful merger. We had people that were committed to building a business together, and it has been flying. So when people tell you that the economy is bad and things are hard and it's all so terrible, yeah, things are tough. Things are tough, especially in an emerging economy. We don't have the infrastructure. Government's not pumping the kind of money into the economy that first world countries are doing. But the but Running a business can honestly be the best way for you to make money outside of worrying about losing your job, worrying about corporate stress, but you have to ask the right questions of the right people at the right time. Our second last story is about putting all your eggs in one basket. Now, this can happen both on supply and demand side. It is absolutely essential that you diversify your client base. I'm not saying offer 20 different services. What I am saying is if you've got one big client, you still have to have other clients. You've got to keep an eye on the changes in behavior. So for example, if one of your suppliers is suddenly pushing you for money and pushing you for money and pushing you for money, when they, before they were quite happy with their 30 or 90 days or 30 or 60 days or whatever it is, is there a problem? Is the supplier going to go under? Are you going to lose one of your biggest suppliers? And what's that going to do to your ability to service your clients? Or if one of your clients that always paid on time starts paying later and later and later and later, is there a problem with this client? Does this client have a cash issue? You need to manage those relationships so carefully because if you have one big client, one big error can make a huge mess of your business. And this is true, so true in the construction industry. So you'll often find that when big construction companies go down, small construction companies are taken with them. Why? Because subcontractors were, and you would have seen this in, in the, there were a collapse of a number of the big companies a couple of years ago. Um, Basil Reed, for example, went through business rescue and came out the other side, but a lot of them didn't. And these subcontractors, of which many were my clients, 
had not put agreements in place because the construction industry is, it's a, it's a dog show. Um, trying to get payment up front, trying to get your retention monies out. But what was happening is these big companies were stretching their payment periods by such an extent that the only way the subcontractors could get paid is to keep working. So they kept working because they wanted to get paid because if they didn't get paid and they were halfway through the project, they were going to fold anyway. And in the end, the big companies did fold and many of the subcontractors went under. And at the moment, I'm dealing with a situation where a um, company has bought several different um, premise, premises, pieces of land that a construction company was developing and that construction company went under and now we're sitting with an agreement that's half completed when it comes to um when it comes to actual building um steps there's a sale of land that's been interrupted it's just a mess and the board is deadlocked they don't know what to do they don't know how to proceed because they had used only one big developer and this developer had gone under so I want to compare that to another client of mine. And this client of mine is one of my, he's one of my favorite clients. And he started a business cleaning dirt bins. Okay. That was his business. It's still his business. And he cleans dirt bins. He now has franchises all over the country that clean dirt bins. And you pay something ridiculous, like 250 rand a month to have your dirt bin cleaned. So we're not, you've got to clean a lot of dirt bins to make the kind of money that he is making. But he never, ever, ever keeps one ball in the air. He is constantly diversifying. He is constantly looking at how do I use this client base, these clients, these franchisees, because he started to franchise, how do I use these to diversify my offerings? So now he started adding other um, sort of, some of those offerings are still coming out that, that tie into what he's already got and he's diversifying his cash flow. So now if three of his franchisees had to suddenly fall down, he's going to be okay because he's got other things coming in. He's building other ideas. He's creating more and more of an environment of growth and he's doing it sustainably and he's looking at trends. Then there are no, there's no flies, pardon, pardon the pun when you're cleaning bins, but no flies on this guy. And the difference there is again, he has a team around him. He will sit down with me and his accountant and we will sit and we will hammer out the next step, the next phase. He's not an arrogant man. He's a man who knows what he knows and knows what he doesn't know. And he has a team around him. And I have huge respect for him because he also, he built his business up from the ground he doesn't have, he's not, not an MBA, not, you know, BCom honors, none of that. He is just a savvy businessman with enough humility to know that he needs a team around him. So let's talk about going it alone. I see this all the time. Business owners, I've got a, a colleague of mine that says all, all small business owners run the risk of being arrogant or ignorant. Now, arrogance is a problem in business. A little bit of humility goes a very, very, very long way. Understanding what it is that you know and what you don't know is extremely important. And this is where, as I've said before, you need your council of elders. Now, a lot, you don't, small businesses especially, you can't afford everything all at once. You can't have a lawyer on call and an accountant on call and an HR person and a marketing person. and a, You can't have them all on call all the time. But you have to know who your people are. So if you want to get a good accountant, you get the best accountant you can afford, not the cheapest accountant you can get. You can get. You get the best lawyer you can afford, not the cheapest one you can get. And you get a lawyer, in, and I'm speaking about lawyers, any of them, that are the right people in the right industry. So you're not going to go to somebody to do your books because 
because they can tick boxes on QuickBooks. No. Capturing the data is one thing. Understanding the data is another thing. And you have to understand what it is that your business can do. So absolutely, you can keep your costs low. There's so many online accounting packages now that there's really no excuse for you to still be doing your books on Excel. You should be doing your books in a proper accounting package where you can pull that information out. Maybe that means you can only afford to see your, your bookkeeper or your accountant once a quarter, not once a month, but see her. Make sure that you get that information. If you're going to use a lawyer, don't use your dad's divorce lawyer because you, you know him and you know he comes around for a bri every third Saturday. He's not going to be able to help you with your business issues. Same with downloading things off the internet. Absolutely, there's a time and a place for a standard form contract. But you need something that's going to give voice to your business, something that's going to make your business sing, that's going to say, this is how we do business. This is when you have to pay us. This is how much you have to pay us. This is what we're going to charge you as a penalty if you don't pay us. This is when you pay us. This is what you can expect from us. These are our promises to you. This is how professional we are. If you have nothing else in your business, you need terms and conditions that make your business real. So that when you do come to me and you say, oh my goodness, I'm owed a million rand by a client. There are a set of terms that I can use to chase that million rand for you. Because things do happen. There's also no excuse for ignorance because I don't know if any of you know of a business coach called Zig Ziglar. He was, he was one of the founding fathers of business coaching. And he used to talk about the, the um, car university. You can listen to a podcast anywhere. You can listen to an audio book. You can watch a TED talk. You can watch YouTube. You can have conversations with people online. You can go to webinars like this. You may not be able to afford to get the full package, but there is information everywhere. If only you have the ability or the desire to implement and the desire to make sure that you're not on your own. And then it is about planning. It's absolutely essential that you plan and that you have a plan for the best and a plan for the worst that you have a plan that means that every Monday you look at your cash flow, every six months you have a look at your employment agreements, you have a look at whether or not you're going to take more people on. You Every year you go to your attorney and you say, okay, what changes have happened in the law? Do I need to change my agreement? Do I need to do a puppy policy, which I know everybody hates, but unfortunately is a thing. Do I need to have privacy policies on my email? Who need this? How can you help me? Because people want to help you. You know, people in the service industry very often go into these service industries because they want to make a difference. And they're there to make sure that you don't go it alone. So my one client that has gone it alone is the shareholder in a group of again, we're in the extension of the in construction industry. He didn't take any legal advice when there was a restructuring. He just went along with the majority. He didn't speak to a lawyer, didn't speak to an accountant, didn't structure the investment that he made for tax purposes. And one of the businesses has gone under and he's been frozen out. Nobody will give him any information about where his money is sitting, whether the loan was allocated to the company that's in liquidation, whether it was allocated to a different entity. He can't find his loan agreement. He's got an unsigned shareholders agreement. And he didn't ever ask anyone to walk the road with him. And it was a big investment for an individual. It was a big investment. He now is looking at having to take money out of his pension because there were cross securitizations within the group and he signed an indemnity along with all the documents that he didn't realize he'd signed. He's not a young man and this is going to be a financial blow that is going to take him many years to recover. It's pushed his retirement plans back by, by many, many years. On the other hand, I have 
one of my favorite clients. I have lots of favorite clients. In fact, I don't have favorite clients. I just have lovely clients. This client runs a FMCG company. So fast moving consumer goods. And I have walked a road with him for the last 15 years. He was one of my first clients, well, 12 years. He was one of my first clients when I opened my own practice. And I have watched him grow this business in a very, very blue collar, difficult, logistically complicated environment. But he never went it alone. And it's a family business. And family businesses are tricky. Family businesses can really, can really be hard work. But every step of the way, he's got the best advice he could afford. He got great lawyers involved. And what he did as they grew, because they're now a big company, as they grew, he got different lawyers in for different things. So he got in a finance lawyer, someone who specialized in finance when he did the group work. He got me in for the various commercial aspects that were needed to keep the business afloat. He um, had a, he had a financial advisory service around that could advise him on the financial side of transactions, and then he had an accountant and he has an HR lawyer, he has a, a labor lawyer. But over time, as he grew in his budget, he budgeted for his council of elders. Now, if he picks up the phone, he doesn't have to go oh no, what do I do? Who do I phone? He knows who he has to phone. He's got people around him that know his business and understand him and his business. And he is never alone. And he sleeps well at night knowing that he doesn't have to worry The advice is around the corner. So it's been such a privilege to walk with my clients, both of those, both those that have struggled and those that are doing extremely well. Because you get the ability and the privilege as a lawyer to help people either start again or grow. Now, trust me, it's better to grow than to start again. But if you grow under circumstances that you don't have the right environment, uh, right advice to you, you're not gonna, you, you're gonna struggle as much. So I wanna give you some resources for the, these are for smaller businesses. Um, I haven't read e -Myth by Michael Gerber, you're missing out. He really focuses on how to get from technician to business owner. It's an old book, but it's a great book. And I read it at least once a year. There's an e-myth for lawyers. There's an e-myth for accountants. Tamara, I don't know if you've read it. Um, he really does. He takes the basics and he makes them accessible. Then every business owner should read Good to Great by Jim Collins. It is also a mind-blowing book about how to get your business just to grow, mainly through growing your people. Time to Think by Nancy Klein is a good book about building teams. And Vanita, I definitely recommend this one for you. Then fun reads like The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Now, there's no such thing as a 4-Hour Workweek, so don't get too excited. But his tips and tricks are amazing. Never Split the Difference by Chris Foss. Learn how to negotiate. Go back to your suppliers, get better deals, negotiate with your clients. There are some fantastic TED Talks, Business Movers, A Touch of Optimism by Simon Sinek, TED Talks, Mastermind Groups, Networks. There are so many resources out there that avoiding failure is easier than it's ever been. But it takes guts to run a business and it takes vision to run a business and it is not a solo sport so in conclusion you want to move from technician to business owner as quickly as possible and you don't want your business to be just you you don't want to have to be all the time you want to be able to go and leave you don't want to burn out you want to be a business owner and not just a technician and it doesn't happen overnight there may be a year, two years, whatever it is, where it is just you. And when you go and leave, you don't get paid. But your vision needs to be to grow your business, to understand what it is to be a business owner. You also need to move quickly. Business is about adapt or die. If you think change needs to happen, it needs to happen. 
Now, there's a difference between adapting and chasing bright, shiny objects. So running around, getting the best website, and then deciding that you also need AI, and then deciding that you're going to focus on social media, and then deciding that, oh, this looks very exciting, and this new business trip, that is not adapting. That is avoidance. Adapting is learning how to run your business in a way that is agile, that can move quickly if it needs to move. Choose the right business partners. Rather go it alone than with the wrong person. It, I cannot emphasize that enough because once you're in, you're in. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure that you get the best advice you can afford, not the cheapest advice you can get. If that is the only thing you take out of today, that is what I want you to think about. doesn't mean you have to hire Deloitte to be your accountants, but it means that you, you spend the money wisely, you use your budget wisely, and surround yourselves with experts. Know who you need to call on when there's a problem. Know that business is a risk and be vigilant. And then also accept that sometimes, and this was what Lana asked, sometimes your first loss is your cheapest loss and you may have to close and start again. So the question of when do you know when to quit? In terms of law, if you can't pay all your creditors, you should pay none of your creditors and you should close your business. That's what the law says. And before you all panic and say, yeah, but I'm 30 days behind on my Walton's account, it doesn't mean that you have to shut the door immediately, but it means you immediately have to take advice. You also, have, you also need to seriously consider when you are putting your business together before you even start, before you've put one rand into that business, whether or not that is a portfolio you would support. When people come to me and say, I can make this business work if I sell my house and I put my house proceeds into my business, I always say to them, would you sell your house and put the proceeds into an underperforming share portfolio? And the answer is no. If the share portfolio is not performing, I'm not putting my house proceeds in there. If your business is underperforming and you don't have a plan to get that money from your house back out, selling your house to put your, that money in your business is not a good idea. Cashing in your pension to fund your business is not a good idea. Not unless you know exactly what it is that you are planning to get out and how you're going to get that out. It's not easy to run a business and it's not easy to admit defeat. But when you start again, you don't start from scratch. You start from the base of experience. So let's talk about the good things. The good things is that there is money out there. There is movement in the market. There are people in place that want to run good businesses. And there are clients out there. And there's enough work to go around. If you collaborate, if you avoid the pitfalls that I've spoken to you about, you will be able to run a business that's sustainable. So if you found any value in what I've said today, please connect with me on LinkedIn or on my website, which is heyattorneys.co.za. I'd love to be able to assist you. And I want you to know that you're not alone. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tamron. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Robin. That was, that was really helpful you're and welcome. real information. You're are very there welcome. Lots of nodding um, heads. Are, are there, there any questions? questions? Yeah. Sharon? Yes, Sharon. The unmute. There we go. Sorry, I was just looking at the unmute but button there. So, Robin, the question I have is, say you have started your business and you are trading and doing this and you're doing that. And you've been, let's say, you know, open for like five years. It's it's not too late to come to you and say, look, I haven't got these documents in place. No. Um, come okay. immediately. Come immediately. If you, if you know, people get embarrassed and they think, oh, I don't have my terms and conditions in place. She's going to judge me. I promise you, there is nothing you can show me that I haven't seen worse. I, I once had to 
look at a set of terms and conditions that said that, that it was for a Canadian company where the High Court of Quebec was to be used as the jurisdiction. The business was based in Joburg. Okay, so I've seen it all. So if you realize that there's something missing, come, let's fix it. Let's sort it out. Okay. Tamron, I think that's it. Awesome. No questions. See, you explained so well. I really enjoyed that, Robin. I enjoyed the fact that you used real life mm. examples. So, you know, and, and and you gave a good one and a bad one. <laughs> so you gave us some hope. <laughs> um, it lots, was really lots awesome. of hope. Lots of good. <laughs> It was really awesome. Thank you so much. And I think this is such valuable training. And I'm I'm so grateful that you did that for us and that we can share it on YouTube and get it out there. So um, I would encourage anyone Thanks. who's not already connected to Robin, definitely go connect with her on LinkedIn. She is so worth following and so worth connecting to. Uh, even if you just book a session just to chat and find out more about what's, what's right and wrong in your business and where she can help you, it's very much worth it. So I do recommend that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, if there's no more questions, I'm going to say goodbye to you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and that you're full of good ideas to go and improve your businesses now. Thanks, Thanks Tam everyone. Thanks, Tamron. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, eh? Bye, guys. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Robin. I'm Hi, very excited to start getting my Council of Elders together and my 